Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update. I'm your host, Richard Wolff. Today, I'll be discussing the rising fuel costs, the gender wage gap, and also how the people of America disagree with uh, President Biden about the state of our economy. And in the second half, we'll be speaking with today's guest, former Amazon employee and labor organizer, Christian Smalls. Well, my first update has to do with a ploy of America's politicians. Yeah, again. In this case, it's governors in some state legislatures that are coming out with what they call consumer-friendly proposals to deal with rising fuel costs, which are really spiraling out of control. And here's what they're going to do, they say. They're going to cut taxes on gas, or they're going to give consumers debit cards to use at the gas station, etc. And they're acting as though they are thereby solving the problem. They aren't. Because if they cut the taxes on gas, or if they give people uh, debit cards, that means they're using the money that the government would otherwise have used for public services to help people buy fuel. And therefore, they're going to be without that money. And either they'll raise our taxes somewhere else, or they'll cut public services. That's not a big help to us. That's just moving things from one category to another, helping us with the gas price and hurting us with higher taxes or cut services. This is flim-flam, and nobody should be fooled. And let's be clear, there is a terrible fuel price inflation going on. It began long before Russia invaded Ukraine, and now it is going to be and is already being blamed on the Russians because it's good these days to blame the Russians for, for nearly everything. Here's an irony for people to understand. The price of oil around the world has shot up, and it's indicated it may go up a good bit further. One of the greatest producers and exporters of oil in the world is Russia, which means that the war in Ukraine, coupled with the sanctions the United States and others are imposing on Russia, is helping and worsening to drive up the price of oil, which is a revenue for Russia. In other words, Russia's war and the response helps Russia pay for the war by the rising revenue from oil. Think about it. And these sanctions that are supposed to hurt Russia, they are making the price of gas and oil around the world higher. And that is helping Russia to pay for the war. But let's be clear, these sanctions with these bad effects for most Americans and the good effects for Russia, are supposed to bring the country to its knees, force them to change their policies. Well, let's see. We've been sanctioning Cuba since 1961. No big success over there, not even close. We've sanctioned Russia since 1989. Things apparently got worse for the U.S., not better. We sanctioned Iran, and that hasn't worked out real well. And the biggest sanctions of all were those of Mr. Trump for all four years of his presidency against China. A trade war, he said, which would be easy to win. Tariffs applied to literally everything coming to the U.S. from China. And we've never seen sanctions like that. And did it change Chinese policy? Not that anyone can tell. So now we have a big sanction against Russia. Notice anything about the continued use of things that don't work? The fuel inflation will pass into everything we do. It is very serious. Oil is the basis of fertilizer. Oil is the basis of how everything gets from where it's produced to where it's consumed on a truck or a plane. We are going to be paying heavily for what's going on in the world. It is not far away. Very strange policy. 
My next update has to do with a very important statistic. The gap between the wages on average earned by men versus those earned by women in our economy. From 1979 to 1994, the gender gap, as it's called, narrowed. Women at the beginning of that time got 38% less pay on average than men, but by the end, 1994, it was only 23%. But then everything stopped. From 1994 to 2021, there was no change in the gender gap. It was 22% in 2021. It was 23% in 1994. This is a fundamental injustice to women in our capitalist economy. And we know how to explain it. Men's wages never went up. Men's wages stagnated. When the women came into the labor force in that earlier period, 1979 to 1994, they went after the better paying jobs, better paying jobs than women had had until that point, and that's why the gap narrowed. But since 1994, under Democrats and Republicans alike, the average gap, the injustice of underpaying women hasn't been changed. Yes, we have seen women become CEOs, not large numbers, but enough to tell a story that women were advancing. And yes, women were allowed into various professions. And that's a good thing. But for the mass of women, no, 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 no. Window dressing for a few, typically at the top of the income distribution. But for the mass of our women, no. The injustice continues. It's part of the whole assault on the working class. Men's wages didn't go up. Women's, as they came into the labor force in the earlier period, got better because the women entering the labor force got slightly better jobs. But since 1994, that's 25 years, friends, the injustice has been perpetuated, not addressed. And that stands as a critique. The working class was really hurt because during those times, output grew and profits grew, but the wages didn't. Not for men and not for women, nor did they change the gap between them. An injustice perpetuated may be playing a role in the revival of a militant labor movement that we're going to be hearing more about later today when we talk with Chris Smalls from Amazon. And my final update for today can best be described as understanding the basic difference between how Mr. Biden wants us to think about the economy today and how the mass of the American people feel it, live it, and think about it. I'm going to draw here on the University of Michigan's Surveys of Consumers. This is one of the oldest, most widely uh, used survey of what the American people are feeling about their economic situation that we have had. It's very old, almost a century now. It started in the 1940s. Uh, it's remarkable, and we use it all the time. Well, here's something to think about. It is currently at its lowest level, that is consumer sentiment, how they feel about the economy since August of 2011. Here's another statistic. 32% of the people surveyed expect their own finances to worsen in the future. And that is the worst number since these surveys began, as I said, in the mid-1940s. The current level of consumer sentiment, March of 2022, 59.4. A year ago, March of 2021, when we were still in the depths of the pandemic, it was 84.9. It's gotten 30% worse over the last year. And here's some more data for you to think about. Mortgage rates this week, 
hit 4.4%. That adds $300 a month to the average mortgage in this country to stay in your home. We have the highest inflation rate since 1982. Wow. That's light years from the robust American economy or the great American economic recovery. Those are quotes from President Biden and the advisors around him who speak to the public. This is mirage politics. This is saying that it is what you wish it would be, but the sentiment from the surveys of consumers undertaken by the University of Michigan speak a very, very different story. And here's the game. The Biden administration uses the one good number they can find, unemployment, which is down. That's an interesting number. That's absolutely appropriate to talk about. But to use that and then to say we're in good shape That's the equivalent of going to a doctor when you really hurt all over. He puts a thermometer in in your mouth. It turns out you have 98.6. And so he sends you out of his office and home because you're in great shape. You'd never go to that doctor again. No x-ray, no blood test, no anything. There are lots of ways of determining how well or not you are. And there are lots of statistics that tell us how successful the economy is or is it? Mr. Biden cherry picks the unemployment number. You know why? Because it's the only positive number he's got. All the others point the other way, which the American people, when they're surveyed, made clear. Don't be fooled. All right, folks, we've come to the end of the first part of today's show. And as always, I want to thank our growing audience, whether you're a financial supporter or are sharing our work with others. Your partnering with us makes this show and others that we produce possible and effective. To learn more about the work we do, like producing David Harvey's show, The Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, go to our website, democracyatwork.info, where you can sign up for our mailing list, connect with us on social media, and more. Please stay with us. We'll be right back to talk about Amazon, the American labor movement, the reawakening of that movement with Christian Smalls, a former Amazon employee and an active labor organizer there. Welcome back, friends, to the second half of today's economic update. I am very pleased and proud to bring to our microphones and cameras Chris Smalls. Uh, He was an Amazon warehouse management assistant. He got fired in March of 2020 after he organized an employee workout to protest Amazon's failure to protect warehouse workers from COVID. He helped found the Congress of Essential Workers, a network of workers and allies fighting to protect workers from exploitative CEOs. Chris is president of the Amazon Labor Union based in Staten Island, New York, and he's famous for his Twitter handle, Shut Down Amazon. So first of all, Chris, thank you very much for giving us your time. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Okay, let's begin with kind of the the big question. Why do you believe, as you obviously do, and work to build a union for Amazon employees? Sure. Well, you know, the first the first thing is, you know, they they fired me after working at Amazon for nearly five years. Um, I started with the company two thousand fifteen. Uh, I was an assistant manager for four and a half years there, um, opened up three buildings in the tri-state area. And after I, I, I led the walkout in 2020, uh, they terminated me over the phone. And uh, from that moment, I, I felt that, you know, what happened to me shouldn't have happened to anybody, especially in the middle of a pandemic. 
And uh, what really was the icing on the cake was when Jeff Bezos himself um, held a meeting with his general counsel, uh, David Sapolsky, his uh, top general lawyer for Amazon. And in that meeting, they discussed uh, to call me uh, not smart or articulate to make me the face of the whole unionizing efforts against Amazon. Um, so when I heard that, when that leaked conversation leaked out to the public, to the media, um, I took it upon myself to pretty much continue advocating for workers' rights uh, up until the point where about 11 months ago, uh, we founded the ALU, the Amazon Labor Union, and we wanted to try our efforts here in Staten Island. All right. Give me a sense. I mean, you already have answered this, but I, I need to ask you to expand a little bit. How hard is Amazon working to try to block or prevent or undermine what you're trying to do? Yeah, for context, uh, the, the campaign in Alabama, Investor in Alabama, they spent, um, it's been reported, they spent $25 million last year stopping that union campaign. Um, and they were successful. Um, that, that campaign uh, results uh, came in the company's favor. Um, and they're doing the same thing here in New York. Um, we're trying to unionize four facilities. So they spent the same amount of money or more. We're, we're estimating at least 50, $60 million they spent on stopping us in the last 11 months. Um, you know, they, they're flying these union busters in from all over the country, even all over the world. Some even from the UK, they're paying them anywhere between $3,000 to $10,000 a day. They're holding captive audiences every single day, putting workers in classrooms, trying to uh, pretty much create doubt on joining the union. And they've been doing this for the last 11 months since we started back in April of 2021. And yet, Chris, I understand this, but you know, as a, a person who looks at the media every day as part of my life, I do get the impression, and I'd like your, your judgment here, that despite this kind of effort on Amazon, it's spreading. That is the desire to form unions uh, at Amazon locations, and of course beyond that, but particularly in your case with Amazon, seems to be growing despite their efforts. Is that correct? Am I am I reading that right? I believe so. I believe ever since the pandemic started, um, you know, workers have been deemed essential workers. And um, I, I think we're realizing our value is a lot greater since these companies and these different industries uh, accumulated so much wealth uh, throughout the course of the pandemic, uh, especially Amazon. You know, Jeff Bezos made over $88 billion over our backs. And um, I think now workers are now realizing um, we're worked a lot more. We need to be paid a lot more and treated a lot better. And uh, you've seen the, the the uprising of unions with Starbucks. Um, you've seen all the strikes that have been happening uh, across the country. Um, I think the labor movement um, has a microscope on it right now. And um, I'm hoping that this union drive in New York will also be a catalyst for um, a revolution where uh, unions will start to uh, be back on the uprising in, in this country, you know, uh, ever since the 1930s, um, we're, we're talking about unions diminishing to less than 10 percent. You know, that's that's so important. I, I need to draw you out to get more from you about this. You know, all those years since the Great Depression, since the 1930s, when unions really rose up and and changed America, everybody involved has been wondering when will the decline stop? When will the year by year, smaller numbers, smaller numbers, right down to the 10%, as you say, what is going on now that hadn't gone on 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago? What, what, how do you account for the fact that you're able to mobilize now, that people are moving, like you say, in Starbucks and all over the place, as well as... Our, well, you know, we're all trying to figure out why is this happening, partly because it's important to know, but partly it's important to understand how best to sustain this kind of a change. Yeah, I always mentioned uh, 2020 was, uh, it was kind of like 2020 vision to a lot of systemic problems in this country. Um, you know, from the labor movement to the social injustice movement to the environmental movement, um, all these things are are um, under a microscope as far as what the American people want in this country uh, going into the future. You know, pre-COVID, um, a lot of things were 
were, were uh, just going and operating without people really paying attention. But when everything came to a stop, it seemed like workers and the, and the working class people, um, we kind of realized that we can't just go back to what it was pre-COVID anymore. Um, so now what you're seeing is, uh, you know, workers not just quitting their job, they're unionizing, they're organizing their workplaces. And, um, and, and that's what it's going to take to uh, get to a better place and, and apply that pressure to our lawmakers. Um, the laws are, need to be revamped. Um, the 1930s um, obviously are not the 21st century anymore. And these industries that we're organizing um, have been crushing union campaigns for, for decades. And now we're at a point where once again, um, the younger generation, um, myself and, and other activists, um, we're, we're putting pressure on lawmakers to uh, pass things like the PRO Act, which will protect workers um, to organize their workplace. And if they can't do that, we have to apply pressure on the NLRB pressure, the NLRB, which is the National Labor Relations Board. You know, uh, let me ask your opinion on something. There's been a lot of attention over the last four or five months on the remarkable statistics about people quitting, walking away from a job because it's not bearable or it's not tolerable anymore to stay with it. But I remember thinking to myself, I understand the frustration and the anger and, and, and all of that, but if you leave a job, you're gonna go have to get another one and you're gonna face more or less the same kind of conditions so that is there a learning process going on where people quit and then realize that's not the solution, but organizing a union and changing the way the workplace is set up is a better solution. Is something like that going on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, even myself, you know, I, I wasn't a union organizer. And now look at me, I'm, I'm the current interim president of the Amazon Labor Union. Um, you know, I realized from working, um, being pretty much deemed an essential worker since I was, you know, 16, 17 years old, my first job at Target. Um, you know, when you when you quit a job and you get another job, you're jumping from one fire into another fire. Um, you know, as you mentioned, you know, more or less, it could be better or worse. And uh, what I realized after Amazon, after pour, pouring my blood and sweat and tears into a company uh, for nearly five years and and then giving it my best shot to, to move up in the company and, and just for them to uh, you know, terminate me wrongfully, um, that pretty much woke me up to uh, saying that something needs to be done. You know, this can't just be happening to everybody and everybody just be okay with it. And I think now people are realizing, um, you know, we can't just quit our jobs anymore because it, that means nothing gets changed, nothing gets done. The system continues to operate the way it's been operating. But if you unionize, you organize your workplace, um, things can change. And um, I think that's what workers are realizing now as well. Is it going on all over the place? In other words, I, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want wishes to take over my brain. So I want someone like you who's right in the thick of it. Do you feel, do you see this really beginning to spread all over the place? not just at Amazon, not that that wouldn't be a big breakthrough just by itself, but is this really now, can we talk about a general, you said it a few minutes ago, a general reawakening, let's call it, of the labor movement? I believe so. And I believe, um, you know, Anna, Amazon um, is obviously one of the, the most powerful retailers in the world in modern history, uh, along with Walmart. Um, and I believe workers are paying attention. You know, I can tell you from my own personal journey that, uh, you know, workers have been reaching out to me from different industries for the last two years, ever since I've been terminated and been in the public uh, advocating for workers' rights. So workers are definitely watching to see what we're doing um, here in New York and, and watching to see the outcome of this election. Um, and it, it, win, lose, or draw, I believe that it doesn't stop anything. It only just, uh, once again, show workers that it's capable that it's possible to um, even get to this point. And I believe that workers are gonna start uh, unionizing at a rapid pace because now they see that uh, once again, uh, the CEOs of these companies are making billions upon billions on our backs and they're flying this space and coming back and thanking us. Um, it's, and that's just not gonna fly with us anymore. 
If we're essential workers, that means that we're necessity and that means that they need us. Okay, here's a hard question. You took a loss, that is the unionization effort that you mentioned earlier in Alabama and so on. But it looks as though win, lose, or draw, as you say, uh, this isn't going to go away, that these losses are not going to destroy the morale or, or uh, you know, be like a punch in the gut where you can't go forward. It turns out that the organizing effort knows it's going to win some, lose some, but the, uh, the, the point is to keep going. Is that Am I right that that's the kind of spirit that's now there so that a loss here or there doesn't have what the owners wish it did, which is the effect of stopping the process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't even consider them to be losses. I just consider them to be, uh, you know, minor setbacks, you know, because we're not going anywhere. Um, The workers realize, um, even though uh, they were unsuccessful last year, um, you know, that Amazon spent $25 million trying to stop that campaign. They they interfered with it. That's why um, the board ruled for them to have a rerun, which is actually currently going on at the same time. So uh, hopefully they'll be successful the second time around in Alabama. But I'm um, here in New York uh, for sure. I can tell you uh, whatever happens uh, at the end of our election uh, when the results come out, uh, we're not stopping. You know, once again, as the current interim president, Um, We already have a second election due for uh, next month in April at our second facility that we organized. And I can tell you once again that I have interest in over um, 18 buildings all across the nation from different workers and different facilities that want to unionize. So um, for us, this is really just the beginning. This is really just day one for us. Are you getting any help from the political, uh, the politicians? are you, if you are, is it sufficient? Uh, what's your, the relationship between this effort, which affects so many people, and the political parties that run this country? Well, I mean, uh, unfortunately, it's not enough support that, that we have. Uh, as of recently, we, we started to have a couple politicians show up um, to our rallies and events. Um, you know, that was pretty much after we already filed for our petition. And um, as far as the, the public support, uh, we don't have as much as we should. You know, this should be one of the most uh, talked about campaigns in the, in the entire country right now. Um, but unfortunately, we're not. And that doesn't, um, it doesn't add up when you're talking about politicians that's on the left, that, that stand in the labor movement, that stand up for uh, workers' rights. There's a lot of progressives that claim that they stand on the solidarity uh, with these workers, but I haven't yet um, had their support yet publicly to the point where you know Amazon workers can realize that they they do have this type of support, um, so they they need to do they need to step up. That's a guarantee that they need to step up is, and, and also help out and support in any way they could with their uh their platforms. Well, thank you, Chris Smalls. I hope this program helps right there on that last point of yours to build support in the public and among the people who claim to represent us in the public. uh, You are changing this country by the struggle you're waging, and you are a hero for, for many people, and you deserve our support. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. You're welcome. And to all of my audience, I hope you have learned what is going on a bit in the labor movement. It is remarkable. It is crucial. And we will be talking about it more. I look forward to speaking with you again next week.